This video introduces the idea of work from physics and the key role of integration in doing work calculations. If a constant force F is applied to move an object a distance D, then the work done to move the object is defined to be work equals force times distance or in symbols W equals F times D. The units of force can be given in metric units or in old-fashioned English units. Since force is mass times acceleration, the units of force are going to be units of mass, which are kilograms, times units of acceleration, meters per second squared. This collection of units is also called a newton. In English units, force is given typically in terms of pounds. Now, the units of work, since work is force times distance, and distance in metric units is in meters, that gives units for work of kilograms meters squared per second squared, or we can write work as newton meters, and this collection of units is also given its own name, which is the joule. If we're using English units for work, work again is force times distance, so the units become pounds times feet, or usually this is written instead as a foot pound. Now if I give you my weight in pounds, I weigh about 140 pounds. Those pounds are already in a unit of force. So that 140 pounds, my weight, is also telling the force of gravity on my body. But if I tell you instead that my mass is 63.5 kilograms, well that's a unit of mass, not a unit of force. So if I want to know the force due to gravity on my body, I'm going to have to multiply that 63.5 by the acceleration due to gravity, which is 9.8 meters per second squared. That product works out to be 622.3 kilogram meters per second squared. Notice that we now have the right units for force. We could also say that's the force of gravity on my body is 622.3 newtons. Now that we've familiarized ourselves with units a bit, let's do some examples. As our first example, how much work is done to lift a two pound book off the floor onto a shelf that's five feet high? Well, we know that work is force times distance, and two pounds is already a unit of force and distance is five feet, so the work done is 10 foot-pounds. Now let's do the same problem in metric units. The two-pound book is actually a 0.9 kilogram book, and we're lifting it off the floor onto a shelf that's about 1.5 meters high. Well, work is still force times distance, but now the force is 0.9 kilograms times the acceleration due to gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared, times our distance of 1.5 meters. That gives us a product of 13.23 kilograms meters squared per second squared, or in other words, 13.23 joules. In the previous two examples, force was constant, so we could just multiply force by distance to get work. Now let's consider the case where force is not constant. Let's say a particle moves along the x-axis from a point x equals a to a point x equals b. According to a force f of x, that's a function of x and varies with x. How much work is done in moving the particle? Although the force is not constant on the whole interval from A to B, if we divide up that interval 
into a bunch of little subintervals, each of width delta x, then on any particular subinterval, the force is going to be approximately constant. It's not going to change a whole lot on a tiny little subinterval. As usual, let's pick a sample point x sub i star in the ith subinterval for each little subinterval. X sub i star could be the left endpoint of the subinterval, the right endpoint, or any point in the middle. Now on the i subinterval, the force is approximately constant. It's approximately equal to F at x sub i star. Therefore, the work on that i subinterval is approximately equal to this constant F x sub i star times the distance that the particle is going on that subinterval, but that distance is just the length of the subinterval delta x. Instead of thinking of the big picture of the particle going all the way from a to b, I'm thinking of it going just along the first subinterval with an approximately constant force at a distance of delta x. And then it's going to go the second subinterval. Again, the force is approximately constant times the distance of delta x. And then we'll do some more work getting it along the third subinterval, another approximately constant force times delta x, and so on. Each little tiny bit of the way, I'll get another little chunk of work. And then I can get the entire amount of work by adding all those little chunks of work up. So the total work done is going to be the sum from i equals 1 to n, where n is the number of subintervals, of the work done on each subinterval, which is f of x sub i star times distance delta x. I should say this is approximately the total work. In order to get the actual total work, we'll need to take a limit as we use more and more skinnier and skinnier subintervals. So the limit as n goes to infinity of this Riemann sum. The limit of a Riemann sum is an integral. So we've got the integral of the force f of x dx, and we'll integrate between the minimum x value of a and the maximum x value of b. And that's our formula for work. Let's look at a physical example. How much work is required to lift a 1,000 kilogram satellite from the Earth's surface to an altitude of 2 times 10 to the 6 meters above the Earth's surface? We're given that the gravitational force is F equals G times capital M times lowercase m divided by R squared, where M is the mass of the Earth, lowercase m is the mass of the satellite, R is the distance between the satellite and the center of the Earth, and G is the gravitational constant. We're also given numbers for the radius of the Earth, the mass of the Earth, and the gravitational constant. This problem is different from the problem of lifting the calculus book. When we lifted a book over just a few meters, the force of gravity was essentially constant over such a small distance. So we could use the equation work equals force times distance. But in this problem, since we're moving the satellite a larger distance, the force of gravity changes with distance. And so we need to use work as the integral of this force with respect to distance. The distance variable in this problem is r, so I'll rewrite this using the equation for force and integrate with respect to dr. I'm starting at the Earth's surface, so that's a distance of 6.4 times 10 to the 6 meters from the center of the Earth, since that's the Earth's radius. And I'm ending at a height of 2 times 10 to the 6 meters above the Earth's surface, so that's a distance r of 6.4 plus 2, or 8.4 <coughs> times 10 to the 6 meters from the Earth's center. My only variable for this integral is r, so let me pull out the constants, and I'll rewrite the 1 over r squared as r to the minus 2. 
Now I can integrate and r to the minus 2 becomes r to the minus 1 over minus 1. I'll rewrite one more time and substitute in for r to get a preliminary answer of negative g capital M lowercase m times negative 3.72024 times 10 to the minus 8. Now I still need to plug in for capital G, capital M, and lowercase m. My negatives cancel here. And I have G is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. Capital M, the mass of the Earth, is 6 times 10 to the 24. And lowercase m, the mass of the satellite, was 1,000 kilograms. Multiplying all these numbers together, gives us a final answer of approximately 1.5 times 10 to the 10th joules. To put this number in perspective, this is about the same amount of work done by a car in a year or by the human heart beating for about 400 years. In this video, we saw that for a constant force, work is just equal to the force times distance. But for a variable force, work is equal to the integral of force with respect to distance.